everyone. Hello, 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 everyone. Thank you so much for watching this afternoon. For the one, 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 the one
that is being done there by the group. Uh, you know, I've been following a lot on Twitter lately. I've been talking to a lot of the local players as well, uh, including Oscar Bonaventura. You know, I've been talking to these people, learning what is going on. And it will be good for us to really just see what is possible in terms of collab collaboration. What What is unique about EG that the rest of Africa can learn from? But what can EG also learn from the rest of Africa as well? I think this is the way we need to think in this generation. Yes, yes. We have great, great minds in in Equatorial Guinea that I, I have been witness myself. And now that the campus is expanding through the CEMAC, I think it's even more like excited for us because we've seen so much with the two first editions of Tech Campus. Now in the third one, I think like other great minds are going to 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 appear and uh, also like becoming a, a a regional platform. Like it's a great great achievement for Tech Campus. Uh, thanks, Boston, and uh, for for the ones that just logged in. We are in the panel Entrepreneurship in the Digital Age. We are live from Tech Campus TV, Canal Sol, and Cacho Hermanos TV. So let's start from the beginning. ICT sector in Africa. Mm -hmm. We have witnessed significant growth in ICT since the start of the millennium. We have 530 million people, users of internet nowadays in the continent. Mm -hmm. And apart from that, ICT has become a transformational driver for economic and social progress. ICT has have the potential to the potential to make Africa a better place mm -hmm. and improve the life of Africans. Bosun, give me your opinion about that. So, so, so I think if you if you ask me this question, uh, probably three months ago. Uh, I can answer it, but it will be difficult to understand. But I think with coronavirus, uh, this question is now a lot easier to answer uh, because we've seen the power of technology to help to support humanity. We've seen the power of technology to help to connect humanity. And we've seen the power of technology to also break barriers in terms of knowledge, how much you know about things. And I think this is what we've seen in Africa with technology over the last 10 years. The fact that more and more young people, more and more creative people are getting access to knowledge. And with this knowledge, they are building the future that they want to see in their society. Africa is a continent that is blessed with a lot of resources, right? We, we have tons of resources everywhere you look in Africa. It's a beautiful continent as well. But it's also a continent where we've not used our resources strongly enough. And if you look at great nations in the world, what determines the greatness of any nation is how you use technology and science. In, in economics, there's something that is called total factor productivity. So when you take two countries, you give them the same money, you give them the same amount of people, what is going to determine which one is successful is how they apply technical efficiency to the resources that they have. So it's about time for Africa to apply science, to apply technology, to improve on the productivity of each of our continent. This is the only way we're going to be able to create good jobs. This is the only way we're going to be able to create high-paying jobs. This is the only way we're going to be also be able to make more from our productivity. If you apply science and technology in agriculture, you get more yields and you can make more money from it. And from that money, you can create development. If you apply science and technology in education, even though we have a lot of young people, you can train all this population of young people a lot faster. So I think what has been happening in the last 10 years is a gradual evolution of the use of technology. And when you look at countries like, say, in the East Africa, where you have Kenya and Uganda and the likes, where, for instance, mobile money changed financial services. So you have things like M-Pesa in a region where those people living in the rural area are cut out of financial services. But because of mobile telephony, people were able to build a solution that include everyone in financial services. If you look at places like Nigeria, where Andela started from, where the university couldn't train good software engineers, but Andela came up with a model 
to actually train young people to become software engineers. You can see what innovation is doing in that place. In Nigeria as well, you can see things like LifeBank, uh, which is a startup that uses really smart ways to move medical supplies all over the place. A similar example exists in Rwanda as well with Zipline, where they use uh, drones to move medical supplies all across the country, making it faster. You can already see how applying technology, science, and innovation makes us to be more productive. And I think what coronavirus has done is to quickly accelerate that, where everyone in the world today now knows that Africa doesn't have a choice but to apply science and technology smartly. And for us to do this, we have to build innovation support platforms to make it happen. Yes, you're so right. Uh, so another question. What can we do as individuals to improve our business ecosystems across the continent and be able to cope with the digital era? It's a, that's a very good question and, and a deep one and complex one at the same time. Um, the, the reason for that is, is a lot of businesses and, and business support organizations understand business the usual way, which is you grow a business, you target your market, you generate resources from it. But the funny thing about using digital innovation is that digital innovation requires an ecosystem. It requires the entire value chain to, to be on board. So you can create good innovation, digital innovation, but in your country, if you have weak infrastructure, for instance, maybe internet connectivity is weak, maybe not everyone has access to it, automatically that limits how far your innovation can go. If you have good internet and you have good people who are willing to innovate, if you don't have the kind of regulatory environment that makes it easy and comfortable for investors to bring their money to come and invest in these startups, you're going to have a bit of an issue there because they're not going to be able to grow. If you have money, you have infrastructure, and you have smart people, but the education system is not producing enough talent for the companies, you have a problem. So I think as we think of digital innovation in Africa, we have to start to think of ecosystem. What makes digital innovation successful is the availability of the different ingredients that you need to support and power innovation. Good examples is what you've seen in Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley is successful because they have great universities like Stanford over there that supports the innovation ecosystem. They have so many other universities, by the way, not only Stanford, but there's so many universities in the Silicon Valley supporting the work, producing talent, attracting the best talent from all over the world. And those talents, when they come to study, they stay back and become entrepreneurs or they work for the big company. You have investors in Silicon Valley who are willing to invest. So a lot of foreign investors like to go to Nairobi to invest, to leave, to work. You know, it's a place where talent is also good. They have good universities as well. If you look at Lagos, for instance, it's also about the same, not exactly the same as Nairobi, but innovation started leapfrogging in Nigeria as well. When, when you started to see more better penetration of internet, Nigeria is a big market, available cash from diaspora. A lot of the people who left to work abroad, returning back to start their own company, you start to see the ecosystem being built. It's the same you'll find in Cape Town. So when you look at all the top startup locations in Africa, they're unique because of the strength of the ecosystem. You can include Rwanda in that list as well. Yeah. And in your opinion, which countries will be the next? That's, that's, that's a very good question in terms of which countries will be the next. I actually suspect that Senegal has, has the opportunity to be, to be really strong. Um, Senegal is quite unique and Toro, uh, they have some good university there. I think some things just need to move around for that to happen. So I'm, I'm banking on, on, on Senegal. I think you already called, uh, you already called uh, Rwanda. Uh, I think Rwanda is going to be big on the list. Uganda has always been big, but they're just somewhere in between. They, there's a bit of work that needs to happen for the innovation okay. ecosystem in Rwanda, in Uganda to turn around. I think, I think in Central Africa, we've not seen enough movement there, to be honest. And I think, you know, 
just watching what is happening in EG and and because there's there's strong relative stability in EG when you compare it to other countries in in that region. I think EG may have a role to play, uh, but but like Rwanda, EG will need to be very strategic. Mm-hmm. Uh, countries that that are relatively smaller have much more work to do to be become. Uh, a startup or technology or innovation powerhouse. And it's very possible. It's actually quite easier in those countries. But it just means that those countries need to be very strategic and very international in their approach. Because, you know, building an ecosystem and becoming a superpower can be a function of the market or know-how. Maybe you have really scientific and technological know-how. That can also be why uh, you're that unique. The other things that we've seen is that uh, regulatory environment also help at times where a location has the regulation that supports certain kind of innovation. So, you know, some of the best examples in the world are places like Luxembourg or, or say, Geneva, for instance, or Monaco. You know, these locations are small, but they have regulations to say, if you take Luxembourg financial services, so they have regulations that empower innovation in financial services uh, in Luxembourg. So if you take a country like, like EG, um, EG can become a powerhouse around something that is unique. Perhaps tourism, maybe you know, maybe energy, for instance, building around something that is unique to EG, then focusing on that and leapfrogging the innovation around that. It's, it's one of the ways I think locations like that can also become uh, powerhouses. All right, all right. Thank you. So let's get on going. So how do we learn to adapt and evolve our businesses to continue grow in the digital area? That that is that is a very good question and a question that uh, you know most companies are needing to to answer. And I hope if there's anyone that runs a company that is listening to this show. Um, I'd like you to pay attention to this. I hope I'm not talking too fast and you can understand me. No, you're not. Okay. Okay. I think something that is extremely important is that everybody is going to be telling businesses to go digital at a time like this. But the truth is that there's still the problem is still evolving. Uh, so it is important as the owner of a business for you to step back and try to understand your users and the people that you serve. This starting point. Try to have a clear understanding of them. What do they want to consume? How, how do they currently consume? What are some of the limitations that they have at the moment? It's important to have this understanding. Then if you move away from there, the next is the environment in which your business operates. Are there infrastructure in that environment that places limits on you or provide opportunity for you to do your business in a different way? I think once, once you're able to figure this out, then the last thing is for you to then figure out what is your own business objectives? Once you have all these three things, you can marry them together. And somewhere within that is your innovation strategy, the approach you should be taking as an organization. Is your approach meant to be about radical innovation, where you want to come up with almost a totally new market that is em- empowered by technology, uh, you know, that, that makes you to become more competitive? Or should your approach be about using digital technology to improve on the efficiency of your business, which may be, you know, how you improve the services that you do, maybe how you deliver your service. That may be the opportunity. And the other opportunity may be incremental innovation, where you take aspect of your business, you change it a bit, and you continue to set yourselves up to continue to change it. These are ways in which digital innovation can be useful. But a lot of people today are only looking at the very top end, which is radical innovation, and they want to disrupt everything at once. It can happen, but it can also become a problem for your company if you're not careful, because you may put all your resources into it and you you don't get it right. So I think what is important is to look at digital innovation in two ways. One, it's an opportunity for improvement of how I do my work. The other is that you may be an opportunity for you to create a totally new market. Right, it may be an opportunity for you to create a totally market. So you need to look at that and say which one fits my business, and that's where your energy is going to go into. All right. So these are some of the aspect aspects that when you have a good idea, when you yeah. join an incubator, you can uh, develop well. No. 
so that's, so that's for, for that's a totally now different case when you when you have an idea. What I've shared is for existing businesses, mm -hmm. but for people who have ideas and are building, I think what is important for them to take into consideration is the market in which things are being disrupted. Look around you to understand where society is struggling. And that's not difficult to understand. Um, you know, because if you look at it today, education, because of coronavirus, is struggling. There's now need for us to use technology to improve education. Public health, for instance, there's a lot of attention on public health. So the way people consume health care services is going to change. So there's a need for innovation around that, around health care services that we need to focus on. So there's opportunity for innovation in there. Uh, you know, things around even transportation, there's opportunity for innovation. So I think people with ideas need to have that clarity. What is my idea serving? What purpose is it serving in the market? You know, how can my idea help to make a better society? You know, people need to have those kind of clarity. And once you get that, make sure you get into an accelerator that can connect you to opportunities. If I want to build a solution for education today, uh, in EG, do I have access to the schools? Can I work with the Ministry of Education? Uh, if I can't work with them, do I need to go past them to reach the students that I have to reach? How do I do that? So it's not enough to have a good idea. It's also you need to think of the route to market. How do I get a solution to the market? As well? Yeah, all the services sector, no? Like now with the coronavirus, we saw how, how delayed some yeah. people were doing things and yeah. how we need to go yeah. faster looking for another way. Absolutely. Very so now let's talk about motivation. motivation. What would be your advice to the young entrepreneurs that are, are watching us who are reluctant to apply technology to their working processes? Mm -hmm. that's, that's, again, you have a lot of good questions, eh, Isabella? <laughs> so, 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 so motivation. Um, you know what I tell people? Africa doesn't have a choice. Uh, technology is, 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 is going to become a part of how we do everything that we do. But the problem that we have is that technology most of the times are, are platforms. And they're platforms through which society do things. If we don't build it in Africa, someone else is going to build it. And what that means is that in a few years time, our economies will still be controlled by people from outside of Africa. Because these technology platforms will run almost everything. You know, imagine when we're using technology for education that is totally not built in Africa, or we're using technology for public health that is totally not built in Africa. I think it's an opportunity for us, one, to solve problems for our people in the ways in which we want to use it. Nobody understands us better than us. We have a good understanding of ourselves. So... That's the first thing. The second thing is also to building and protecting the future of the continent as well, making sure that the solutions that we consume, a good number of them are from the continent, but we're not just consumers of what other people produce. Yeah. And we actually produce what we consume. I think for me, this is strong motivation. And for those who like to, to make money off the, what they do, imagine what it's going to be like when that solution is built by you. Yeah, I'm Brazilian and I see that a lot in Brazil that we learned to consume what was put in front of us. Front of us and yes. then just now that we are discovering like, no, perhaps like it doesn't work for us, we should uh, work with another kind of solution. Absolutely. True. So let's now move to leapfrogging. leapfrogging. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to digitalization, do you think that leapfrogging is a sustainable way to evolve? Um, that's, again, that one is a tough question. Um, it's a tough question. I see in some cases where we have to leapfrog, uh, but also I think there's a need for a balance. Right? There's a need for a balance for us to grow in very organic manners. Right? You don't want to live from <clears throat> so quickly that you're leaving a major part of the society behind, which which I think is a, is a big problem in Africa. We definitely have to live from because the rest of the world is moving so fast 
the building solutions to, to problems that are moving so fast. But we still have a lot of our population that, you know, either through education, through uh, employment opportunities, through emp empowerment, they're still left behind. So we need to be clear on what are we leapfrogging? You know, are we going to be focusing on leapfrogging education, leapfrogging public health, leapfrogging transportation, leapfrogging innovation in healthcare? Or are we going to focus on leapfrogging innovation and technology that uh, people don't really need? So that balance, finding that balance and creating that balance is, I think, what is important. So, yes, we do need to leapfrog because the world is moving so quickly. But our leapfrogging needs to be tied to the reality of our society as well. All right. And now let's talk about your personal projects. Let's talk about Co-Creation Hub. But first, I'm going to ask you about your STEM cafes that you have currently in Nairobi, Lagos, Abuja, Kampala, and Dakar. Please tell us about that and what is that all about? So, so STEM Cafe for me is, you can call it a place where kids go to play with science. Mm -hmm. uh, you can call it a, 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 a discovery space, you know, it's called stemcafe.io. Uh, STEM Cafe is really, our intention is that, you know, this started last year, even before the pandemic, but we realized that the future of Africa is going to be in the hands of young people who can see themselves as creators, as against seeing themselves as consumers. Uh, young people who have a lifelong interest in science and technologies. Young people who have creative confidence. They're not scared to create things. You know, because a lot of the old Africans have not been raised to be creators. You know, the education, education system is not raised most of, most of us to be creators. So, so I started STEM Cafe and it was, it was a, you know, we're building it as a network across Africa, which is like a science discovery maker spaces where young people can go into and they can find all sort of technology solutions to play with. They can build their own project. They have educators there who will guide them through. But at the end of the day, they can create anything. And as they create, they learn. As they create, they learn. As they create, they become comfortable with science. As they create, they gain the confidence to believe that there's nothing they cannot create. Yeah? So this is the idea of STEM Cafe. Uh, for now, because of the pandemic, the STEM Cafe is short. Uh, but what we're doing is we're still training a lot of young people on the internet uh, across multiple locations. And, and our goal is to open more STEM Cafes in future. All right. So uh, talking about near future and long-term future, let's put five years from now, 10 years from now, and 20 years from now. Uh, what do you think is going to happen with all this current booming ecosystem that is being developed since 10 years ago in Africa? I, I think there's going to be... So the challenge with the ecosystem that is evolving in Africa is that it's not only happening in Africa. It's happening in Brazil, for instance. Yeah. Sao Paulo is big. I've been there. It's a big destination for technology as well. It's happening in Chile. Chile is quite well known. Uh, it's a big destination for technology. It's happening in Asia, for instance. Singapore is one of the top places to go. I think competition is, is rising. Uh, but my, my challenge and my fear is that these ecosystems in Africa are not being fully rounded. I think the ecosystems are, are growing so fast, but the traditional education system, the government and the likes, they're not moving at the same pace as this ecosystem. Uh, which is understandable, is the same in a lot of locations. But I think for these ecosystems to become sustainable, we need to find ways to create that balance. And the more, so, so what I suspect is two, two scenarios. One is that we create the balance, and this balance will mean that we start to see a lot of innovation from Africa, and that people start to invest a lot in Africa, because people understand that Africa is the future. Uh, there's tons of opportunities in Africa. But Africa is waiting for that opportunities to be unlocked, but it's not, we're not unlocking it yet. So I see if we get it right, all this ecosystem will give birth to a new Africa. This is what I see. But if we don't get it right, like so many other promising things in Africa, you know, a good example is that agriculture, for instance, where we have opportunities for agriculture, 
but we've not taken advantage of it. Like so many other things, this may be the case if we don't do the right thing. Yes, but uh, last year the African Development Bank they started a big campaign to to increase the attention no, on agriculture sector and also agri tech because uh, they they as an organization they believe that is is the oh, the next treasure for Africa and uh, uniting with technology it will be only like a big a bigger growth. Absolutely. And um, so now let's move back to motivation and your personal opinions. Mm -hmm. You talked uh, a lot about education and what uh, we should do, the private sector should do. So let's uh, make an example that we have school directors watching us. What do you think that should be inserted in the African education like aspects to be introduced to get the the youth more into this digital revolution that is being growing i think i think the first thing is that uh you know educators administrators those who lead education systems needs to start to understand that the society in itself is changing with or without them uh because of technology kids are having access to knowledge outside of school And this knowledge, whether good or bad, is shaping the way they see the world around them. All right? It's not like probably 15, 20 years ago where the bulk of the knowledge that kids see are from school or on TV. Now, kids with smartphones have access to the internet. Some of them watch YouTube. They learn a lot and they pick a lot from there. And this is shaping their perspective. So educators need to understand the need to adapt. And, and one of the first steps of adapting in this, in this world that we're in within education is understanding and seeing students as the center of attention in the classroom. The teacher is no longer the god in the classroom. The teacher is meant to be the facilitator because the, the students have access to this knowledge and at times they get confused. But a good teacher is a facilitator, someone who helps the student to make sense out of the knowledge. You know, the student find, so they can, they can almost like an inquiry way of learning. You know, so, so that's the first thing that, that we first need to do. The second thing that educators need to understand is that digital technology is going to become, it's the way of, of life in everything. You can't be a medical doctor and not have a simple background in technology, in digital technology. You can't be a farmer and not have a good understanding of how to use, to use digital technology. You can't be an administrator, whether you work in government, and not have a good un understanding of how you use digital technology. So the future is such that in every career you find yourself, you need to be comfortable with digital technology. And educators need to ensure that it is embedded. So when we train young people about coding, or about science, about software development, it's not really because they have to become engineers. Right? That's not the point. The yeah. point is that they can become confident people. Because the future of work for them is going to require that they use this technology. In 10 years' time, work environment is going to be different from what it is today. So while you and I are fixed to this style of working, the young people that we're raising, their future is going to be at a time where digital technology is, is everything. So it is important that we embed it into it. And the best way to do this is to do teacher retraining in a lot of our countries. Because we talk a lot about technology, about the kids, but we forget that we're, we're leaving the teachers behind. So if the teachers themselves are not comfortable with technology, there's no way they're going to be able to help the kids as well. So educators need to focus on also building the capacity of teachers. When teachers have a good appreciation of these technologies, They can then help to use it in classroom and to use it to raise the kids as well. Yeah, uh, what what you told me, I just remember that uh, I think two years ago, a friend of mine in Equatorial Guinea, she got angry with the the school because they were trying to like delete a bit more like the usage of notebooks and insert tablets to the kids. 
and she was so mad like my, my kid was uh, studying in this school as well and she was like no but it's very important for, for them uh, handwriting and how come they give them tablets they are four years old and for me I was like I love the idea but she was like upset she, she thought that wasn't good for for her kids uh, development yeah yeah you know they, so that's the problem we get because we're not we're leaving the teachers behind uh you know the kids can still write on the tablet the te the kids can still learn how to draw on the tablet you know there's so many advantages to it. but because we leave the teachers behind when we introduce technology in education it's oftentimes from the top we enforce it on the on the teachers and the administrations and they don't know they don't know they don't understand the benefits so they struggle but if we carry them along if we retrain them if we give them the the skills that they need to appreciate it then they will be able to help the students as well yeah all right so give us a little brief of what uh, co-creation hub and i hub are preparing for us for the next year or two years <laughs> now that we are so depending on, on the on the digital world on the digital world so so i think for us a, a number of things that we've been working on uh Two top ones is actually on corporate innovation, uh, which one side of it is how do we better collaborate with government to help government understand how to use technology smartly. Uh, we think if our government can use technology really smartly, that they can help in driving innovation, but also development across the continent. Uh, because you can imagine government is responsible for education, government is responsible for health, government is responsible for so many things. If you can work with government to innovate around how they use technology, you can see a lot of development on the continent. So this is something that is important to us. The other thing for us is, as we begin to support more and more startups, we think it's going to be dangerous if we don't support the existing large businesses as well and small businesses as well. You know, those who are not tech startups, someone needs to be able to help them to also understand how to use technology. Uh, but also help them build technological solutions as well. So we think these two things are important. And I think lastly for us is also the whole idea of a single market in Africa, <coughs> which is how do we start to look at the place of innovation and technology in our drive to create a single market on the continent. This is also something that we think is absolutely important. All right. And do you have a message for our 120 competitors of the Tech Campus Hackathon? Absolutely, I do. I think what I have to tell the participants of the Hackathon is that I always tell people that in Hackathons, there are no losers or winners. Uh, in fact, I always tell people that almost all the Hackathons I've been part of, the most successful ones are not always the winners. <laughs> to be honest, I always say this to people. Hackathon is a very good opportunity for you to practice your skill set as a developer. It gives you the chance to solve a real problem. It's an opportunity to work on a big problem in society that typically you will not have the chance to work on. And for me, I always encourage Hackathon participants to give in their best. You never know who is watching. Put in your best. Even if you think your best doesn't make you win, your best is going to challenge you to think of what to do better. And that may be where the breakthrough is going to come from. Also think well as to how you collaborate with your team members if you're working as a team. It's also a great, fantastic opportunity to work with other people to try to fix a problem. And what you tend to see with Akaton is that it is where uh, long, long life, long term relationships are built which is usually the starting point for so many big things. And I wish them all the very best. You guys are the future of the continent. Uh, you know, that Africa doesn't have a choice but to use technology. And you guys are the ones that we're looking up to, to build the technologies that will change the continent for good. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So I was just looking at the clock. So we are running out of time. Uh, so I would like to thank you again, Bosun. We are very grateful to you for your time, for what you dedicated to us, for everything you, you taught us today. 
it has been a real pleasure for me like i learned a lot in this panel and above all it's very interesting to learn everything that is happening from all over africa from what i see you have you have uh, your seed planted we look forward to welcome you in eg in person very soon Absolutely. and to speak uh, with you shortly and learn about your advanced advancement uh, I would like to greet again our competitors from the hackathon. We have international competitors. I'm so excited about that. <laughs> we have competitors from Gabon, our female team from Cameroon, Go Girls, and 10 competitors for Chad. It's very useful and it's, it's, it's very important that uh, international participants join Tech Campus because they make the, the event and the platform even bigger and uh, they help us complete the work that we are only starting. And uh, thanks a lot to our audience and to the Tech Campus team that they are doing an amazing job with the first digital edition and the third edition of Tech Campus, the biggest ever made. Uh, stay tuned on techcampus.com slash tech TV slash. Uh, you can see all our programs live also from Canal Sol and from Cachu Hermanos. Bosom, thanks again. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope we chat soon, in person, if this pandemic. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I look forward to it as well. And thanks for your time. It's been good chatting with you, Isabella. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.